Okay. Can I take on my mask? Of course. Oh my god. <laughs> my ass. Oh, oh my. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about geriatric trauma. I guess I have to stay in the podium, right? Um. Yeah. It's you can move a little, and I'll shift it if you need okay. to. Okay. If we had on Zoom. Right. So why am I going to waste an hour of Dr. Silverberg's precious time talking about geriatric trauma? Right. So what are our goals and objectives? So we're going to learn how to evaluate trauma in the elderly. We're going to manage trauma in the elderly. We're going to really point out the differences between trauma in the older patients versus trauma in the younger patients. And we're going to talk about some special considerations in the elderly patients, particularly some pearls and pitfalls. So why are we going to cover this? Well, we're going to cover the why. We're going to talk about the path of physiology and the principles. We're going to go over evaluation of trauma in the elderly, talk about the management, and then again, do some special injuries and considerations. All right, so why? So you'll hear this thing called the silver tsunami, but in the whole world, especially in the developed world, uh, the ages are getting older and older and older, and there are more and more elderly patients. And if we don't make an effort to take care of them and get good at taking care of them, we're going to get uh, drowned by the silver tsunami. And it's not only in the developing world, but it's also in America. So we call it the graying of America, right? So we're all getting older. The oldest one in that group is the guy in my extreme left. Uh, he's lost all his hair. Okay, I don't know if you recognize all of us. You will notice that the guy second from the right is the most handsome guy. <laughs> His prison shot. <laughs> yeah, that was my mug shot. All right. So even trauma is getting grayer and grayer. And there's a nice series. Uh, one of the authors of that series was Tom Scalia. I don't think uh, you young whippersnappers know who Tom Scalia was, but he was our first chairman. And then Mike was our second chairman right after him. And he, since he left, he's actually been the head of shock trauma in Maryland. But there was a series of two articles on changing of trauma. And the biggest thing in the whole article, the two articles were how they're seeing more and more geriatric patients and how they've had to adjust to it. So why are we going to talk about geriatric trauma then? So it's the fifth leading cause of death in older patients. They have more morbidity and mortality with trauma. And however, if you do proper evaluation and management of them, they actually do pretty well. If you do lousy evaluation management of it, they go down very quickly. Right? So why do they get injured? So the number one cause of the injury in the elderly patients are falls. And it's falls from their own height. It doesn't have to be falls from the World Trade Center, etc. The second most common cause are MVAs, particularly collisions with one driver and also pedestrian struck. In fact, there was a study from what's called the Boulevard of Death. Any of you live in Queens or no Queens? So Queens Boulevard was called the Boulevard of Death. And why? Because there were a lot of elderly patients living in that area. And it's a very long kind of crossing. And these elderly patients would try to get across, the light would change on them, and they would just get smashed. And almost everybody who died there were actually elderly <laughs> patients trying to scramble across. So be careful the next time you go... Uh, Visit in Queens, Mark. But the good news is they changed the light and they made it last longer. Yes. So they can get across. So they actually did something positive with that data. Yes, and that's important because you have to be able to adjust when things are not going well. And they weren't going well. And then suicide is actually not uncommon in the elderly, although the most recent studies of suicide has shifted more to younger people. So it always was said, 
you know, the older white guy like Gernsheimer are going to either pull their hair out like Mark Silverberg or they're going to kill themselves. But actually it's now younger and younger. So it has changed a bit. Right? Why else would they get injured? Burns, assaults, abuse, something you have to keep your eye on when somebody comes into the ER, an elderly person who's been assaulted or looks like they've been assaulted. And then this compared to younger patients, penetrating trauma is uncommon in elderly patients. So let's talk a little bit about falls. So that's a geriatric syndrome. It has a lot of morbidity, mortality, and causes. Um, in fact, we're thinking about applying, actually we started the process, myself and Soraya, of applying for a geriatric ED, and Rich has been involved in helping us as well, uh, in applying for a geriatric ED at uh, UHB, although it's hit a bump in the road, not having enough nurses to take care of regular stuff right now. But <clears throat> one of the prerequisites of being a geriatric ED is you have to have a project. And there are various ones, like how to deal with patients with altered mental status, how to deal with elderly patients with abdominal pain. And our project that we actually picked was prevention of falls. So it's actually a big deal to our ASAP, who is sponsoring the accreditation to be able to prevent falls. And falls in the elderly affects everyone. They fall, now they can't do the uh, ADLs, they can't do the activities of daily living. Now it falls on the family or it falls on society to get them someone who can help them with it. Um, and falls cost billions and billions of dollars each year. So it's a big deal that affects the whole population. So you always want to ask yourself why someone fell. Number one, an acute problem. Did they have an arrhythmia and syncopized? Did they have a stroke? But also, most falls are actually due to chronic medical problems. Things like problems seeing and hearing. Things like problems with bad balance and weak muscles, right? Uh, medications and alcohol are, are big deals, and we'll talk a little bit about those later. Home environment, the cat runs in between the legs of this poor elderly lady. My only friend they have is a cat or a little dog runs in, in there, right, Mike? You have two big dogs that you have to worry about that you're going to trip over. Right. So, but it's important to look at the home environment. And any elderly patient who has fallen, you have to make sure that their home environment is checked out, as we'll talk about later. Um, so some questions. Why are these important in the elderly? What do you think about a one-person MVC, motor vehicle collision? Why is that something that should turn up the red lights on you? Well, you have to worry, why did they do that, right? Were they like Tiger Woods and, you know, something going on there? Or did they have a stroke? Or one of uh, my attendings at Lincoln, uh, we helped me set up the residency there, Dr. K. He was one day leaving the Bronx, going to Queens to his house there in Flushing. And he was going over the Whitestone Bridge. And suddenly his car kind of rolled into the side of the Whitestone Bridge. And when they went to get him out there, thinking, oh, man, you know, just a plain accident, he actually had a big stroke and wound up not dying from the collision, but dying from the stroke. Okay. <clears throat> Pedestrian struck. So again, as I mentioned before, that's a big deal because it happens more in the elderly than it does in younger patients because we're slow. Right? If any of you have seen me walk with my cane, you know, you see how slow I am. In fact, when I walk with Rich and I walk with uh, Jimmy Hassell, they always leave me in the dust. <laughs> you know, 
How dare they? How dare they? <laughs> How dare you, Rich? <laughs> so, um, and then large burns, elderly patient with very large third degree burns there, they're probably gonna die. In fact, when you have a disaster in a big triage, often say you have a elderly patient with 88% burn, they're gonna get the black heart. And then repeated falls. So these are important because those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. So those who fall are doomed to repeat it. They fall again and again. And unless you find out why they fell and can correct that, they're gonna fall again. And they're at high risk. So when it comes to fall prevention, as Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Because the next time they fall, they may break something or they may no longer be able to function. Um, so you want to be able to prevent that. And the biggest risk factor or to know in the ER that someone is at risk for falling again is someone who came in with their first fall. Even if it seems like, oh, they slipped on the ice. So there's a nice study done in the American Family Physician Journal that looked at modifiable risk factors, what things you can do to prevent falls, both falls in the ED and falls at home, right? So in the ED, if you've noticed, we actually have fall prevention. So if somebody comes in, the nurses right away evaluate them if they're a fall risk. And some of you may have seen, they put this rose color band on them at UHB when they come in. And sometimes if they're really confused and a high risk, I'll assign someone to be one-on-one -on -one with them. Interestingly enough, there's a study that shows that putting them in mechanical restraints to keep them from falling actually increases their injuries. They pull at it and then they, they break something or they wind up leaning over the rails. So anyone who falls is already, who's elderly should be considered at high risk. And these are the modifiable risk factors from that article, okay? So balance impairment, gait impairment, muscle impairment, neuro impairment, medication use is a bad one, common one, sensory impairment, like eyes and ears trouble and environment hazards at home, the little cat or the slip rug or the stairs without rails or the shower without rails. And again, anyone who's had a previous fall, that should be a warning that they're gonna fall again. And here are some tips uh, to, for a senior to try to prevent falls. And it's from that article. Um, there's a nice article, um, and I, I thought I actually had it here, but there's a nice article recently from the Annals of Emergency Medicine that says that if you take a patient who has fallen and in the ER, you have two things happen to them. One is that you get a physical therapist to see them and evaluate them and arrange for home follow-up. And you get a pharmacist in the ER to go over their meds and then talk to their primary about changing their meds around. That actually substantially decreased the amount of falls that occurred uh, and the return to the ED because of falls. Actually, over a six month period, there was a substantial decrease over ED returns in those patients who had that evaluation done in the ED. So let's talk just for a few minutes on pathophysiology, because I know Rich likes pathophysiology. Um, so when you're older, there's a de decline in your physiological systems, right? You lose your reserve. So when you get injured, you have a lot more trouble being able to handle it. Uh, there's a decreased ability to keep your homeostasis. So again, to get injured, you'll crash much sooner. And then you'll have a lot of other things going on because over your long life, you accumulated all these life stresses and diseases and toxin exposures. So like me, for example, I mean, I have atrial fib, I have hypertension, I have 
mild CHF. I have two fake hips, two back surgeries for spinal stenosis and degenerative disc disease. I have cataracts and I have decreased hearing. And I'm on 10 different medications. So you can imagine, you know, all the things going on with me if I get injured, right? And then all the systems that are involved are the following. So it's almost your whole body that gets involved. So the consequences of all those changes is you have more diseases, you're more complicated to take care of, you have less ability to cope, you have greater severity of these illnesses, and you can have more adverse drug reactions. So I like to call them Gernsheimer's four gems, right? Four geriatric emergency medicine principles. Comorbidities make diagnosis and treatment more difficult. Diseases present atypically, so the diagnosis is more difficult and it's easier to miss things. You're more likely to decompensate rapidly and you're more likely to have adverse drug reactions. So with geriatric trauma, the morbidity and mortality is greater. Triage and evaluation and treatment are much more complicated. And it is recommended that if possible, a significant injury in an elderly patient should go to a trauma center. So what about the ABCs, right? Primary survey and with resuscitation. So it's the same, you follow A, B, C, D, E. However, it is a little different because it's much more difficult to do. And let's just talk about that, look at some of the difference. So you have your primary survey, as we all know from our ATLS course. Okay, and then besides those ABCs, you have Gernsheimer's ABCs, right? So they're often, the presentation is atypical, so you have to be aware of it. You have to pay much more attention to elderly patients. B, you have to be nice. You should be compassionate and caring. And you have to be supportive and realize there are a lot of social issues that can occur. Anybody recognize that person? My best teacher ever? My mother. Yes, your mom. <laughs> okay, so what about the elderly airway? How is it different? So number one, you gotta be very careful about avoiding hypoxia and you wanna give O2 uh, right away because the elderly don't uh, tolerate hypoxia very well. Bagging can be difficult because if they're missing their teeth and their lips are all weak like mine are. Uh, that's what my wife tells me anyway. <laughs> and, uh, okay. And, you may be forced to intubate earlier and it may be a lot more difficult, especially if they have a stiff neck from osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, right? C-spine is more likely to be injured. And you may have to adjust the RSI doses, especially if they have uh, renal failure, which often they may have. So breathing, you have to avoid hypoxia. Uh, you have to worry about chest wall injuries. The ribs break much easier in older patients than they do in younger patients, and they're more likely to get lung damage and to develop a shock kind of lung, more likely to go into respiratory failure. And they still need pain meds and respiratory care, maybe just as much, if not more, than younger patients with chest wall injuries. So they have decreased cardiac reserve, so they don't respond well to hypovolemia. And the clinical evaluation often can be misleading. They may be on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers like Viltiazem, so they may not become tachycardic, and they may be already on antihypertensive meds, so when they lose some volume, they suddenly become hypotensive much quicker. And you really have to monitor them closely for bleeding. And they're very prone to have hidden bleeding. Often they can't tell you where they're bleeding from. So you have to look at the abdomen, their chest, their retroperineal area, the pelvis, 
and especially the hip and the long bones are much more likely to break in them and to bleed a lot more. Um, so you want to be aggressive with your fluid resuscitation and your transfusion, but you also have to monitor closely so they don't get overloaded. You want to look for hidden bleeding and they probably need imaging more than you would even would in younger patients. And you want to get surgery and IR needed earlier on. And especially you may have to reverse anticoagulation because it's much more likely that they're on uh, anticoagulants than younger patients. And we've seen that a lot, even from minor trauma. We've seen a lot of intracranial bleeding that had to be reversed. Uh, and then the disability. So they may already have a pre-existing cognitive deficit. They may have some dementia. And so sometimes it may be hard to know what's acute and what's not acute. They're also at much greater uh, risk to get an injury in the brain, particularly subdurals, right? Because they have atrophy and even minor trauma. And I've seen this at UHB several times where an older patient comes in and there's hardly any history of significant trauma and then you have a big subdural. So you want to, again, be liberal and have an next uh, whatever no. it is no. you don't no. at, at the county just at UHB and here there's a mine you might so here is some dog hematomas so this one is acute you can see mostly white this is subacute and you can miss it this is mostly gray and then this is chronic which is going to look dark and look like atrophy sometimes and i've seen it missed so you have to be very careful when you read these the ones i most often see is kind of like acute on top of chronic they're more likely to have C-spine fractures. Spinal fractures are common, and especially with the most common neural deficit that you'll see, even from a mild fender bender, is central cord syndrome, right? Everybody knows what central cord syndrome presents. It's right. You have more weakness in your upper extremities than your lower extremities. And then the E. So you have to completely undress the patient, but you have to avoid hypothermia. And the elderly, again, are much more prone to become hypothermic. And then you have to monitor them very closely. Your secondary survey, again, you wanna get an ample history and you wanna do a complete physical exam, but injuries, again, can be very subtle. And you really have to undress these patients and be more liberal in getting imaging. And then when you're giving the meds, including pain meds, we always have the rules. So what does the SLGS stand for? Any, anybody know? SLGS. So start low and go slow. So rather than give six or eight of morphine, maybe start with two or four, and then rev it up slowly, okay? And then always you have to worry about definitive treatment about risk benefit more so in the elderly even than in younger patients right so some special injuries you'll see in the elderly as mentioned rib fractures are more common pulmonary contusions are more common and complications of rib fractures especially pneumonia are more common abdominal injury again you have to have high suspicion and the clinical exam can often be misleading, so you're probably going to wind up imaging them more, even with minor trauma. I had a case in fast track of all places at the county last year where an older patient who had fallen uh, was triaged to fast track, and my medical student going over her found that her belly was tender, and it turned out she had rib fractures and a ruptured spleen. Right? Musculoskeletal injuries are very, very common. And the problem with them is they lead to 
uh, deterioration of their activities of daily living, being able to feed yourself, being able to go to the bathroom, etc. And the common fractures are wrist and hip and femur, humerus and pelvis. So you really got to go to do a good exam, including neurovascular, and get appropriate imaging. So does anybody know what's the most common fracture in the elderly? And one we see all the time in fast track at the county. Anyone know that? So it's actually Collie's fracture, right? It's the most common fracture in the elderly. The distal radial fracture with dorsal displacement of the hand, as you can see here. And it's enough to throw off the uh, activity of daily living of someone who was pretty independent, just having that cast on. Hip, uh, femur, and pelvic fractures are very common. And with hip x-rays, as Mark has pointed out, I've heard him say it, you may miss them on regular x-rays. And you may need a CT, which is better, or even an MRI, which is the best. And when I had my uh, first hip problem, I uh, coming home one night from fast track, just walking, and I suddenly got pain in my hip. It wasn't figure it's just a strained muscle. And I got x-rays eventually because it wouldn't go away. And it just shows some DJD. But it got worse and worse and worse. And finally, I got a, an MRI and it showed a fracture. And a cold fracture there. And a, a, an interesting story. The only time, it shows how nice Dr. Casey is. Nicer to me than myself. But the only time I ever showed up late for my shift at UHB was I was on crutches. I thought I could be a he-man and was strong enough to handle crutches. And I was going to get these wonderful biceps and impress my wife. And I was, I was coming in from Jersey City by Uber. And I went to my office all the way in the back of Kings County and then had to go to my shift at UHB and very difficult I found to go on crutches and uh, Dr. Shah who was even older than me though passed me walking across the street and squealed on me to Mike and when I got there I found Mike and Roger Holt glaring at me and said you're going home <laughs> I, it took me literally 30 minutes to go from my office to UHB. So it can be very difficult for elderly patients once they have a fracture to even do simple things like using crutches or walking. So for example, again, here was a hip fracture. X-ray, fine. You get the MRI and there's definitely a big fracture that is not going to allow that patient to walk, right? And the big trick with these fractures is to get the elderly patient out of bed as soon as possible. If they stay in bed, they get pneumonia, they get the cubit eye, their muscles become weak, and things just go downhill from there. So this is my Aunt Frida. It was my Aunt Frida. True story. She was in a... <clears throat> Uh, kind of a nursing home in Jersey. And she had COPD from all these years of smoking camels and lucky strikes. And, well, but she was doing okay. She was on oxygen. She was 92 years old. She tripped over her tubing from her oxygen in the nursing home, broke her hip, went to surgery, deteriorated through surgery, got fluid overloaded, went into pulmonary edema, then developed a pneumonia on top of it and wound up dying and never got out of the hospital. Soft tissue injuries, we see this all the time in the fast track at King County, but even minor blunt trauma can cause significant skin injuries in the elderly, right? The more easily you get infected, uh, you need to do good wound care, avoid the cubit eye, Make sure they're up to date in tetanus. They may not be. And they need good nutrition and hydration. One thing I have found that a very nice suture to use for elderly that have these kind of injuries 
is actually a horizontal mattress because they have these friable edges and it's hard to get near the edge. And they have these gating. So if you use the horizontal, you don't have to be near the edge as much. So that's something I learned in fast track. Right, another special consideration is to consider elder abuse. And the laws regarding elder abuse and the reporting of it varies per state. It's not a federal law, for example, like it is uh, for child abuse, right? But it's common. I don't know, a few years ago, we had a, a case that was missed initially at UHB and it made a, a big deal. You probably remember it, Mike. Um, but especially just like in kids, you consider when the injuries don't make sense, the so-called mechanism of injury just doesn't uh, make sense to what you're finding. If they had any physical signs of neglect, neglect is actually the most common kind of abuse that you will see in the elderly, more common than physical or sexual. And if you suspect it, you should do the right thing. You should report it, don't send the person home. Again, if the person is intact, if they not don't have dementia, uh, then it's gonna be their decision. Uh, but if, you, if they can't take care of themselves, you have to step in and don't let them leave, right? The disposition, you should have a decreased threshold for admission because you have to make sure that they can be taken care of at home. They live alone and now they're on crutches and they live on the third floor of a non-elevator building. It can be very hard for, for them to be uh, taken care of. So if they have not support, you may have to admit them. Obviously, we don't want to, but you may be forced to do it. Uh, often, a trauma injury may exacerbate comorbidities. Um, and you may have to admit them for pain or safety for follow-up issues. And they may need rehab. And then you always have to consider end-of-life issues. And you always have to consider what the patient wants as long as they have kind of good cognition. Don't discharge them to an unsafe environment. Anybody recognize where this is from? This is from Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Right? So always, if you're going to discharge, and make sure you have good follow-up, get social service involved, make sure they send out a visiting nurse or someone can do a good assessment in the home to avoid the trauma happening again. And they're going to need a good ger comprehensive geriatric assessment to prevent falls. So I found at UHB a very good person to contact if you're worried about an elderly person needs good follow-up is to call Dr. Islam. That man is a saint actually. And to call him and he will arrange uh, for them to be seen in sweet eye either by himself or by somebody else. In addition, at UHB, we, I mean, at Kings County, we, we can uh, send them, refer them to the geriatric clinic if they're over 65. And Marie Reed Durant is another saint. Uh, she's just wonderful. And if you use my name, we're friends. She actually takes care of my older cousin. Uh, she will arrange to... Uh, to either see them herself or get someone to see them. So in summary, the elderly are more susceptible to injury. They have higher mortality and morbidity. The mechanism of injury are different. Falls is the big thing. And again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, to quote Benjamin Franklin. Um, and you need to rule out a medical cause of why they fell and to, and to do something about it so they don't fall again. And again, you need careful evaluation, but aggressive treatment if you find something wrong and good follow-up and good social disposition. Anyone knows where this picture's from? You wanna take a guess? It's from Haiti. Okay, I, this is one of my favorite pictures. Okay, here are my references. So a really uh, <clears throat> nice, uh, chapter on geriatric trauma by uh, Amal Matu. Uh, really, this is in the Emergency Medicine Clinics of North America and 
2016. The article I talked about that Tom Scalia helped write uh, from the many article, The Changing Landscape of Trauma, two-part series, and mostly talks about trauma in the elderly. Uh, and then the um, really nice article about preventing falls in older patients, American Family Physician. Uh, and then there's a nice article, as I alluded to, uh, from December 2020 about preventing falls uh, and recurrent and recurrent visits to the ED uh, by getting a pharmacist and a uh, physical therapist to see the patients in the ED in this study. Okay, any questions? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, as expected, as always, Joel, that has been a uh, fantastic uh, coverage of a very important topic. I just want to emphasize what you said several times in that sometimes when an elder comes in after, after a fall and you ask them what happened, they might not actually recall that. So they'll say, I slipped. Mm -hmm. So very often on the charts, we'll see mechanical fall. And, and that's probably, that's much more likely, but you still, you still have to, you know, investigate. You still have to put them on a mind. You still have to make sure that they didn't fall for another reason because they'll say, I slipped. And in reality, they didn't slip. They had a dysrhythmia or they had something else going on. So I yeah. want to emphasize that. And even if they did sleep in their house, they're at risk for slipping again. So even if it turns out maybe their eyesight is bad, maybe their shoes are terrible, maybe they need foot care. So even if it is mechanically, you have to be very careful. And then the complications that can occur from that slip and a fracture are a lot worse than it occurs in someone who's younger. I, I, I mean, I wound up with two fake hips because of a Nicole fracture in one hip. Uh, there was a question on Zoom. Uh, it's for Dr. G. Are you aware of any studies that show geriatric trauma codes decrease morbidity and mortality? They do this at Lutheran where all geriatric, any trauma lady get a code. And have you seen any basically studies that, that affecting any? So symptoms? the only study I know of, there was a study looking at bringing elderly patients to trauma centers where I would suspect it would be more of a trauma code. And those studies seem to say they did better if they were brought to a trauma center through any significant trauma. So that's the only study I know, but I assume or that that's what probably happens to the geriatric when they bring uh, them to a, a geriatric center rather than bringing them to a smaller private hospital. Yeah. And they do do better because they get better monitoring and seen by, by better surgeons and by better ED physicians. Yeah, actually, I was going to comment on that. If you look at the trauma notification guidelines, there's always age cutoffs, and, yeah. and that's because there is evidence that comprehensive care and early detection uh, does have better outcomes. Uh, and it's just having that lower threshold uh, to getting people involved and being aggressive in, in a geriatric patient. And as you guys see in NYU Brooklyn, most other trauma centers where there's pre notification or pre activation uh, really not dependent on our evaluation. Every elderly patient that comes in gets gets like some sort of notification, even for even for seemingly minor falls. Uh, so something to be aware of, and this that's happening for a reason. It's because of what Dr. Durham is presenting here. So have a low threshold, even for low mechanism injuries. Yeah, so Dr. Willis was saying that even the trauma guidelines suggest that you should do that and have a trauma code, even for what seems to be less minor stuff in the elderly. And some, and like I mentioned, some studies show that if they're brought to a trauma center, they do do better. Uh, I had a comment. Yeah. yeah. I thought this was really, really helpful and great. So a couple of things that I just, so PT now at County is very good. They're, they've been a lot more proactive in the ER actually, which I would low threshold to call them. And a lot of, there's been a few cases I've had recently where they recommend a walker and social work will actually just get you to write the prescription and then bring it down. So that's one thing. And, a, a, and something that I didn't even think about, but had like a couple cases of was like wrist fractures or like cause fractures or fractures and elderly who they're dependent on that hand to use their cane. And then now they're, they're an unstable patient to go home with. So they also need PT for that as well.
uh, was those are just a couple of things that I kind of picked up on throughout my time. So yeah, and, and that's the problem. They you have to be able to get be able to get rehab to come to ED or bring the walker. They need to be trained to use the walker a little bit. It doesn't take a lot. I mean, I used the walker after my hip surgeries. Uh, but it takes something. You can't just say, here, take the walker, go home. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, and that's that article that I talked about uh, by Goldberg in uh, 2020, uh, December of 2020 in the Annual of Emergency Medicine, talking about getting a physical therapist and a pharmacist to see the patient in the ED. And when they looked at their, their primary um, results of, of this art, in this article was decreasing six month visits back by the elderly and it was substantially decreased uh, than it was when they didn't do that. So both things seem to be very important, uh, but yes, and you should, if you can get that done, that would be a really important thing to be able to do. Um, so I agree, if you can. And yeah, and, and in the county, at least during the day, you can get that done. I actually brought that up at the meet, the one meeting we had to talk about making a geriatric ED and, uh, at UHV. And I was kind of shouted down that they would, by case managing, they'd never be able to do that. They have to get that at home. So if, I, one of the pleas I would have, if you're going to send home an elderly patient who has fallen or you think is at risk for a fall, make sure everyone gets a case management, uh, you know, uh, a case management a consult because they can send somebody out. What they do is they send out a visiting nurse and she decides, yeah, they do need an evaluation of the home environment and they do need physical therapy or there's a question of their meds and she can call that. But they would not themselves allow me to get a physical, at least not yet, a mm -hmm. physical therapist in the ED to give them a walk. At UHB? Uh, hmm? At UHB. This was at UHB. Okay. But the county, yeah, because Gus, <laughs> Gus had set up because they want patients being admitted for disposition. So if they can get them stuff to get them out, then he set that up actually. It's a nice thing that he, he actually did for elderly patients. Mm -hmm. But at UHB, I, they have so far said no, but we're going to bring it up again. Any other questions? Okay. How did I do on time? Very, very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, you have 30 more minutes, Joel. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can I talk again? Yeah. Can I give you <laughs> another lecture? <laughs> uh, just two more comments on the, the Zoom. Uh, Kathy said the updated trauma activation guidelines for level one for age 65 and older and level two with any uh, physiologic like blood pressure or GCS abnormalities and that'll be posted in CCT soon. So. Yes, and especially again, it's very tricky because they may not be tachycardic because they're on beta blockers, which a lot of elderly patients are on or diltiazem or verapamil. And they're also more likely again, as the studies show, to become hypotensive suddenly on you, right? They don't have reserves. So when they do have even a law, a small loss in volume compared to a younger patient who's, you know, who's pretty in great shape and get shot as versus somebody who gets hit by a car and is bleeding in their abdomen or in their hip or their pelvis, they tend to suddenly just go down real quickly without warning. So yes, so anything abnormal like that, you should jump on them. And again, as Dr. Willis pointed out, and he's pointed out again, that the new trauma guidelines uh, definitely talk about being more aggressive in, in evaluating and treating the elderly. Great. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. G.